What can Russia offer Africa? Vladimir Putin is hosting leaders from the continent, promising aid and lashing out at the West. But with his country at war, isolated and under sanctions, how much can he deliver? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Cyril Vanier. African leaders are in Russia for an economic forum hosted by President Vladimir Putin. Moscow says it wants to bring Africa closer. But in a polarized world after the war in Ukraine, that's not an easy task. 17 leaders attended this second Russia-Africa summit, less than half the number of the first summit back in 2019. The collapse of the Black Sea deal on Ukrainian grain exports is causing concern in Africa about rising food prices and shortages. So can Vladimir Putin reassure Africans that he is a reliable partner? And do African countries risk being caught in the middle of the crisis between Russia and the West? We'll get to our guests in a moment. First, though, this report from Victoria Gatenby. Russian President Vladimir Putin center stage at an economic forum for African leaders in St. Petersburg. It's being held at a time when Russia is at war and under sanctions, and many African countries face rising food prices and shortages as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Putin has promised to supply a small amount of free grain to six African countries. Russia's share of the global wheat market is 20 percent. Ukraine's is less than 5 percent. This means there is Russia that is making a significant contribution to global food security. African nations depend on grain imports from Black Sea ports. But last week, Moscow withdrew from a UN-brokered deal that ensured safe passage of millions of tons of grain from Ukraine, which was helping to prevent food shortages in Africa. Analysts say this summit is an opportunity for African leaders to lobby Putin. For Africans there, I think um, ensuring that they, remain, they retain access to grain is going to be a big part. But secondly, that there is some sort of movement on the part of Russia suing for peace because the continuing war in Ukraine is having second effect, um, second order effect in Africa. But this summit is about far more than grain. Russia exported more than $16 billion worth of goods to Africa last year, and it's one of the biggest exporters of arms to the continent. Russia spends around $2 billion on African imports annually, mostly fruit and vegetables, nuts and minerals. Russia wants closer relations with Africa, but in a polarized world following the war in Ukraine, that isn't easy to achieve. Only 17 leaders attended this second Russia-Africa summit, less than half the number at the first summit in 2019. We need to negotiate very wisely the collaboration with Russia. We don't want to, sh to change uh, one colonizer by an another. We need to have a fair connection, fair collaboration, and we need to be clear about all the goal we have. Many African leaders attending the summit are also cautious not to risk their ties with the West. It's a difficult balancing act during a time of global instability. Victoria Gatenby for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests in Moscow, Viktor Olevich, lead expert at the think tank Center for Actual Politics. In Luxembourg, Eric Atsha, executive director of the African Policy Forum. And in Nairobi, Abdi Wahab Sheikh Abdisamad, chairman of the Horn of Africa Institute for Strategic Studies. A warm welcome to all of you gentlemen. To start off this discussion, I want to ask the following question. What's in it for Russia and what's in it for Africa. So, Victor, why don't you take the first one? What's in it for Russia when it comes to this Russia-Africa summit? Well, Russia is facing a massive attempt to isolate it by the collective West, by the United States, its European and some other allies. And, of course, uh, Russia is seeking to break through those attempts at isolation and to maintain and expand its economic political, military, uh, humanitarian, and other relations with partners in Africa, in Latin America, in, middle, in the Middle East, in Southeast Asia, and other regions of the world. Of course, Russia has had, traditionally has had, extensive relations with uh, African countries, 
and with uh, some African political movements uh, when, uh, when uh, the United States uh, labeled Nelson Mandela, the head of the African National Congress, a terrorist, used to label him a terrorist in the early 80s, it was the Soviet Union that supported him and supported uh, the anti-apartheid uh, movements in uh, South Africa and in some other, in, in uh, what used to be Rhodesia, in some other parts of Africa. Mm. And so this competition, uh, uh, this political competition and economic competition in Africa between uh, Russia, the United States and its European allies and uh, China, some other, uh, some other world players, uh, this competition is uh, is uh, expanding, and Russia wants uh, wants to play a leading part in uh, in uh, uh, supporting and uh, uh, helping uh, African states develop economically and uh, in other ways. So, uh, from okay. uh, from what the perspective of what Russia can do for Africa, uh, Russia has just written off. 23 billion dollars in uh, in debt to African countries. That's about 90 percent of the debt that African countries had. Uh, so Sorry, what was the percentage step. there? I missed that number. Uh, that the, it's what percentage of the African Russia. debt? That's uh, 20, 20, 23 billion has been written off right now in debt to various African countries. That's about 90 percent of all the uh, African debt to to Russia. So so Russia has just wiped out most of the debt that was owed by various African countries to Russia. That's a very significant economic step, and it, uh, it, it's going to be taken positively in a number of African uh, capitals. Uh, also, uh, it's important to note that Russia and Victor, has I'd like to, I'd uh, provided like to bring... medical assistance during the Ebola epidemic. Mm -hmm. I'd like to bring Abdul Wahab into this conversation. And by the way, the, this number that the 90 percent of African debt towards Russia has been uh, has been wiped out. I, I can't fact check it right now, um, but I think it, it certainly deserves to be looked into. Uh, Abdul Wahab, I, I need to ask you the question then. What's in this summit for Africa? Um, Africa became a battleground for East and West, specifically Western countries and uh, China and Russia on the other side. Africa is not Africa of the 1970s, 1980s, or late 1990s. Africa is awake right now. They are going to balance between the power of the West and power of the Russia and China as well. When the BRICS form, Africa, they realize that multipolar system now is real. So they want, they, want to, they want to show the world, they want to balance the power of the East and West. That's why Russia today is hosting more than 17 countries of Africa so that they are going to revive historically, you know, relationship between the Soviet Union and Africa. If you remember well, early, 1970, early 1960s, the Soviet Union has assisted the African liberation, you know, movement in Africa, specifically Southern Africa, Mozambique, Angola, you know, South Africa, Somalia, Yani, Zimbabwe. You mentioned it. They are going, in fact, to revive those issues. So that Africa today, they, uh, you know, they are willing more than ever to invest Africa, to revive its historical relationship. That's exactly what Russia now is, is up to. As we speak right now, they, in fact, they, they just, you know, uh, write off more than a 20 billion, you know, or, uh, or debt of Africa. In addition mm. to that, Russia now, they are, they are going to deliver almost 25, 50, 50 million ton of the grain to the poorest African states, like Somalia, Eritrea, Central African Republic, Zimbabwe, Mali, Burkina Faso, and others. That's exactly they are going to revive. They, they are going to revive the investment. They are, so, Abdi they are Wahab, do you invest Africa more than ever? So, Abdi Wahab, do you believe those Russian promises of supplying more grain? And the reason I ask you this, and the the, the reason um, I think it might be worth some of our viewers uh, raising questions uh, about this promise is that last time Russia made a promise at this summit, the first edition of this summit was in 2019, Russia said we're going to double our trade uh, with African countries over to $40 billion a year, and that hasn't happened. They haven't even reached half that level. So I understand that Russia says it's going to provide more grain, but do you believe that promise? I think so. This time around, Russia is very serious. Right? 
like no, no, like, like no other. To be honest with you, Russia, they are really do, going to assist African, African society. They promise this time around, they have to deliver whatever they promise at the summit. And this time they're serious, to, you know, delivering what they call the promise they made. And up to now, they are, they are willing to deliver more than 50 million tons of grains to the poorest country in Africa. They mm. want to also invest in African society. They want, in fact, to relieve the debt of Africa so that they, they, they want to, to see, uh, you know, Russia as an equal partner, not a colonizer. If you look at mm. the Western world, to be honest with you, for the last 60 years of African, African independence, what they, what, what they promised only, what they're doing in Africa only, uh, you know, humanitarian aid and also, you know, security issues and some, you know, and a cultural colonization, just embossing these cultures, uh, you know, against the African values and cultures, and since, such as the gays and the lesbianism and so on and so forth. And that's exactly what Africa, they don't want it. Africa, what they want is a good governance. They don't want what they call a shady democracy. In addition to that, what Africa today is looking for is a good governance. You know, for instance, uh, uh, Gulf states, there is no democracy, there is a good governance. So you now the China and the Russia, they are willing to build Africa. They are, in fact, investing in infrastructure, surface sector, industry sector, agriculture sector. So they want, this time around, they don't have lip surfaces. Africa is awake. It's not Africa of 1970 or 1980 mm. or 1990. Africa, they want someone who can convert his energy and commitment into resources. We don't entertain what they call a rhetoric, you know, speeches. Africa doesn't entertain that. Africa, they want a development. They mean business. If you mean business, come to Africa. But, you mm. know, the issue of the Western, Western world, just, you know, you know, lecturing and dictating Africa is over. It's over. It's a part of the thing. They, they will not accept it anymore. Eric, let me bring you in. Victor and Abdel Wahab have essentially telling us this is a win-win. It's a win for Russia. It's a win for Africa. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks for that. And uh, um, I, I will like to have a different view from what the, uh, my previous uh, panelists just mentioned there, because... If we look at where this is all coming from, given all what is happening in the world today and the conflict itself, um, we should be extremely very, very cautious with all the promises coming out from there in Russia or coming from the Kremlin. Because as you mentioned, or as you intercepted when the previous speaker was talking, promises were made back during the first um, African-Russian summit in 2019. We haven't seen anything coming out from there. So I do not see why anyone would want to believe that today or the promises being made by Russia today will be fulfilled tomorrow. And we would also see, especially this aspect of the grain, which Russia seems to be playing on. And unfortunately, many of these African leaders are falling for it. If we see the timing where Russia decided to disrupt the UN broker Ukrainian um, grain deal that was ongoing, it tells you that he would or he, he, Russia had the intentions to use the grain as a as a tool to to lure some of these African leaders into dancing to into the tune which they want. Now, uh, who is in Russia today or who is attending this summit today also says a lot. If we say from all the fifty plus nations in Africa today, we have just a handful, seventeen um, head of states or seventeen countries being represented there tells you that this isn't going as planned from the uh, Russian perspective. Because if we look at those attend in attendance, um, other than countries like Egypt or South Africa that have a more business or organizational tie with Russia through their BRIC relationship, you would then tend to see countries like um, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, or Guinea, or Sudan, all military leaders who have they sidelined by the rest of the war, given the way they all came to power. Now they know that their only other option or the only other good friend who may smile and, and embrace them in is Russia. And that is why they hurriedly took their flights and landed in Moscow today to mm. attend what many have criticized and continue to criticize. Um, I do not really see this um, summit as a win-win as the previous analysis presenting because Russia has every good reason to make the gains from this profit and what they have in return to offer the African leaders who are there are simple empty promises, I would say. 
Okay, so Victor, over to you. What do you make of this attendance that's in free fall? You know, as uh, Eric was reminding us, and as we said at the top of the show, the last time they held this summit, Russia had 40-plus African leaders, and now they have less than half of that. What does that tell us? What do you infer from that? Uh, well, first of all, to clarify the uh, debt, uh, forgiveness, that uh, it's not overall to Africa, 90 percent has been written off, but to, uh, to some African countries. Uh, and uh, as far as attendance, obviously, uh, the United States and uh, uh, some of its European allies have applied tremendous, tremendous pressure on African capitals to have the level of presence uh, and participation in this time at lowered. But at the same time, key players have been in attendance the pre presidents of Egypt and South Africa, the presidents of Zimbabwe, the prime ministers of Algeria and Libya, even the prime minister of Morocco, uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, although Rabat has been uh, an ally of uh, the United States for, for a very long time, uh, the president of Uganda has been in attendance. So it's not surprising that the uh, attendance has dropped since the last Russia-Africa summit took place in uh, 2019, because geopolitical tensions have risen, the uh, conflict between Russia on one side and the West on the other side has become more complicated and more intense, and uh, the pressure on various African states to uh, attend or not attend uh, has also intensified. Of course, African states are interested in, de the de in their own development. Mm. And just as... Uh, as um, it was true in the last Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, that lasted for 40 years, from the late, from 40s to the late 80s. The African states, just like other parts of the Global South, have been interested in effectively using the confrontation between uh, the West and uh, and Russia for their own economic benefit. That's uh, it's a logical uh, and uh, justified approach. Uh, to keep relations with uh, various centers of power, mm. whether it's Russia, whether it's China, the United States, India, Japan, and others, who are able to provide assistance and to provide uh, and, and to uh, maintain healthy uh, economic and other political and other relations. Victor, can you pause so, there for a quick uh, second? Uh, can Russia you pause for a quick second? How does it how does it actually move the needle? I completely understand on a macro level when you say it's important for a country like Russia to want to break its isolation, nurture partnerships with other countries. I get that. Intuitively, I think everybody gets that. How does it actually move the needle when it comes to the Russia-Ukraine war and to Russia's most pressing issues, sanctions relief, all of those things? What benefit do they get from being a, from having that diplomatic pull, that they can bring in those African leaders, that they can talk to them, that they can host all of them for a summit? What difference does it make? Well, the United States and some of its European allies are attempting to create a media picture in which uh, everyone in the world, all uh, the international community as a whole, is against Russia. But that is simply not correct. And Russia is interested in showing that it is not uh, it is not uh, correct, and that there are a number of uh, partners and allies around the world, including in Africa, that are willing and, uh, and uh, to, to keep their relations with Russia intact and maintain and expand cooperation with Russia uh, in economic, political, military, and other spheres. Mm. Uh, it's also important for Russia how uh, various uh, African countries vote at the, in the United Nations and in other international forums. It's also important what positions they take concerning the uh, war, the military conflict in Ukraine. And um, uh, as far as the grain deal, well, Russia was also interested when it signed the grain deal in keeping the grain deal intact, and Russia was interested in the grain deal working. It, in fact, it was being extended uh, every couple months. But uh, the Russia's, uh, Moscow's position on this is that the Western countries refused to abide by their side uh, of the deal, they refused to uh, reconnect Russia's agricultural bank to SWIFT to have transactions for Russia's fertilizers, ammonia, and other products being exported, too. There, there were two sides to the grain deal. One side was 
Ukraine being able to export its grain, but the other side was uh, Russia being able to export its agricultural products, fertilizer, uh, and other products uh, as well. So Russia was not uh, felt and had warned for many months that unless its interests would be taken into account, the grain deal at some point would uh, w would be abrogated. And unfortunately, unfortunately okay. for everyone, it has been abrogated. And at this point, it's a question of re renegotiating a new grain deal or uh, supplying uh, the poorest states of Africa and some states in the Middle East with uh, with grain. Uh, separately, uh, not, uh, not through the grain deal that was, uh, that's not, no longer valid anymore. Abdel Wahab, what kind of support do you think African nations can provide to Russia? And is it in their interest? And to be uh, to precisely, you know, Africa, they are going to balance the West and East, as I told you before. You know, multipolar system now is real. So Africa... And Russia, they are going to have a mutual, you know, partnership, you know, mutual, res mutual respect. And in fact, uh, you know, in Russia, they are willing to invest in Africa in terms of what they call education, health, health, healthcare system, and the infrastructure, surface sector. To some extent, the agriculture sector, they are going to assist African society. In addition to that, in one of the issues right now, you know, the, uh, the summit was addressing is. And Russia also equally has to open this market to African products so that they can easily, you know, betray the, the Russian market as well. So since uh, the PRICS was formed just a you know, couple, couple of years ago, you know, some, some years back, and in fact, what's good for the South is Africa to balance, the, you know, the, the PRICS, you know, member, member status and, mm -hmm. and Western member status. The problem is what is going, what's going on in Ukraine. Just a proxy war. We have nothing to do with that. And if 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 the proxy war is between Russia and NATO, that's up to them. Africa only they are going to mediate a peaceful resolution of Ukraine crisis. If they're willing to do so, are, we are, are in they fact, Africa is ready to mediate them. That's but, why Ramaphosa and other. If if they want to if they want to mediate between Russia and then Ukraine, that's why the Ramaphosa and other African states they want there at least to ease the tension between Russia and Ukraine as well. But, uh, but unfortunately... And, sorry, just, a, just a quick so pause on that. You're, so just Africa a quick pause on that, Abdul Wahab. You're right that a month ago there was a delegation led by South African President Cyril Ramaphosa uh, to try and mediate um, a... It's not a full-fledged peace plan, but to try and mediate an easing of tensions between Ukraine and Russia. And when they landed in Kyiv on the first leg of their trip, uh, the Kremlin pounded Kyiv at the time with uh, air attacks. I, I, and what came out of that trip, it's very unclear that it really moved the needle in any significant way. You know what, what the African, you know what the South African spokesperson said? He never had anything on kind of that. That's exactly what they said, the African delega the South African delegation in, in Ukraine. So in, in other words, what we mean is if they are willing to Negotiate between, uh, you know, if we, we can, Africa can facilitate, in other words, the, the, the tension between Ukraine and, and Russia, if both countries are willing, are willing for. But, you know, the question is, what we are avoiding for is what you call a proxy war. Africa, they don't want to be, to be in the middle of the proxy war. That's exactly Africa, they want to benefit both sides, both West and also the Russian-China alliance or BRICS alliance. That's exactly we're going to palace it. South Africa can gain a lot from both sides. Mm. But, you know, the, the problem is Africa, they don't want to be in the middle of the crisis. They want to, to, they want to be in the middle of the, what they call a proxy war between the East and West. That's exactly what Africans are avoiding, avoiding for. Eric, this notion that Africa sort of needs to balance both sides, Western partners along with Russia, so that it isn't just a victim of this crisis, what do you think of that? Um, my views on that, I, I would say, let, let, let me quickly interject this aspect here that we seem to be in a situation of the Cold War. I think my previous, our previous panelists have mentioned that. I just want to reemphasize that fact that the situation we are seeing today, given the position of Africa and the ongoing conflict, is not so very different from the Cold War era. And um, I wouldn't shy to say that Africa somehow is fast becoming a victim of this war. 
a war that has nothing to do with Africa. But as history has always been the case, it's repeating itself. Um, Africa is turning out to be the victim. And what we've been cautioning and advising some of those we talk with is that it's um, an opportunity, a once-in-a-time opportunity that um, puts Africa in a position where if they leverage well, depending on how they go about it, they could benefit from the current situation. But should they um, embark on the wrong approach, which I'm afraid seems to be more likely, it will backfire and the ramifications will be enormous. Because how Africa benefits from this or how or where, uh, where the relationship between Africa and Russia ends up today will depend on how this war in Ukraine ends. If it ends well from, for Russia, then those who were on the side of Russia will benefit, or maybe South Africa will benefit. If Russia is defeated, I mean, if they come or if they are weakened, then the future, I would say, may be very, very grim. And if you allow me here to bring an aspect, which I've also been trying to, to, to put out there, that the situation we are faced with in Africa today, where you have countries alienating or trying to lean towards Russia, is purely based on a void that was created or that has been created over the years by the Western countries. Because we have a plethora of conflicts going on across Africa, and the Western countries haven't done what is expected of them to help or, or, or attempt in, in resolving them the way one would expect. And therefore, people in those countries say, all right, if we believe that we're in an era where democracy was being preached as the future and development was our agenda, but the Western countries that have colonized Africa over the years, they've been present here over the years, are not helping us. They are not doing what they need to do to help resolve these conflicts or take us out of these challenges, we may be All better right. leading towards Russia and, and, see, and see what comes out of it. And then you mentioned something about what African, Africa can do for Russia. The, the, the team that was led by Ramaphosa and the Egyptian head of state to Russia to go help mediate the conflict was a pure, it was pure hypocrisy. It was, it was a sham because there was no way that African leaders right. in Africa had dozens of conflicts around them. They tiptoed across those conflicts to go and pretend resolving a conflict between Russia and Ukraine which was far, far more than them to do. So it, it's something which has been criticized and will be criticized today in the yeah, future. We're running out of time. Eric, thank you so much. I want to thank all our guests today, Victor Olevich, Eric Acha, and Abdi Wahab Sheikh Abdisaman. That's all the time we have for today. for today. Thank you, too, for watching. And you can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Cyril Vanier, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.